Greetings, this is Greg. I want to talk about the Supermarine Spiteful and the naval version, the Sea Fang. This video is part of a series on what I'm calling Super Props. For purposes of this series, Super Props are World War II era piston engine combat airplanes that did not see combat in World War II. The Spiteful and Sea Fang appear to be serious challengers for the title of best super prop, especially in terms of pure performance. Let's be clear, the Spiteful is not a Supermarine Spitfire. The original idea was to put a laminar flow wing onto a Spitfire Mark 8 fuselage, but the changes needed to the fuselage were numerous, and they really ended up with a whole new airplane. In an earlier episode in this series, we talked about North Americans' P-51H Mustang, which was an all-new airplane. It's not at all the same as the earlier P-51D that saw so much action during World War II and the Korean conflict. The P-51H was quite a bit lighter than the earlier Mustangs, the team at North American having taken in some lessons from Supermarine on building lower-weight fighter planes. The Supermarine Spiteful is to the Spitfire what the P-51H is to the P-51D. It's an all-new airplane with lessons taken in from the Americans in much the same way that the P-51H was an all-new airplane with lessons taken in from the British. The British were, of course, very familiar with the P-51 Mustangs. They were the ones who requested the plane be designed and built in the first place. They had operated them, and they had certainly looked into why the plane was so fast, easily faster than a Spitfire on the same amount of horsepower. Some of this was attributed to the Mustang's wing, which was of a laminar flow design. Now, laminar flow design does not mean that the actual wing on the production airplane will have much laminar flow. Production tolerances, tiny imperfections in the surface, even dead bugs smashed onto the leading edge could cause rapid deterioration of the laminar flow that was achieved in a wind tunnel. There's an entire section about this in NASA's book, Wind and Beyond. The short version is that NACA and the British, who studied the P-51, found that in practice, very little laminar flow existed on the P-51's so-called laminar flow wing. However, the Mustang was getting a lot of its speed from the precision with which the plane was being built. It was said that if they could have built the Spitfire as perfectly, it would have been just as fast. For the spiteful, Supermarine would abandon their now classic elliptical wing design so famously used on the Spitfire for something thought to be more modern. The resemblance to the P-51's wing is unmistakable, but it's not the same wing. It's an all-new wing, and it's a Supermarine wing, not a NACA wing. But I don't think the influence of the P-51 can be denied here. Supermarine also upped their game in terms of construction quality. It's said that the Spiteful's wing contours were accurate to within five thousandths of an inch. That's about one-eighth of a millimeter for you metric folks. Imagine building a wing with that level of accuracy over its entire surface. That seems incredible to me. For comparison, I tried to find out what the tolerances are for the wing surface on a modern airliner's wing, but found nothing on this. I suspect someone in the comments below will chime in with the numbers. In late 1942, Supermarine came up with the specifications for what would become the Spiteful. The British Air Ministry liked what they heard, added in a few of their own requirements. They wanted good visibility for the pilot. By that, that really meant a bubble canopy. They wanted armament consisting of four 20mm cannons, and they wanted provisions for folding wings for a possible naval variant, and the use of contra-rotating propellers. The project started in earnest in 1943. Initially, they considered naming the plane the Supermarine Victor, but that name somehow shows overconfidence, while at the same time not really sounding very aggressive. If you think of the names of British fighter planes of the era, they normally sound pretty aggressive, a force to be reckoned with. Spitfire, Hurricane, Typhoon, Tempest, Whirlwind. Victor just doesn't seem to have it. They considered simply calling it a new mark of Spitfire, the Spitfire Mark 30 or whatever it would have been by that point. Consider the P-51H. It's a totally different plane than the 51D, but it's still called a P-51 Mustang. The Germans, BF-109F, had almost nothing in common with the 109D. Both are still called 109s. So calling the new plane a Spitfire didn't seem too crazy, even though it was a new airplane. However, it was pointed out that because the new plane really wasn't a Spitfire, calling it one could create havoc from a parts supply point of view. 
That's a good point. I know in the automotive world, the constant use of the same name for new models of cars causes some parts confusion. The Air Ministry then settled on the name Valiant. Supermarine didn't like it. They wanted a name that began with the letter S, and somehow everyone agreed on Spiteful around March of 1944. I do think it's a pretty good name. The plane first flew a few months later in June of 44. Only 19 Supermarine Spitefuls were built, and three of those were prototypes. Some sources say only 18 were built, so go figure. In those airplanes, they used three different variants of the Rolls-Royce Griffin engine, the Griffin 69, 85, and 101. First, we have the Griffin 69 with 2,300 horsepower. Some say it had 2,375 in this application. Maybe it did, but this data from Rolls-Royce says 2,300. The Griffin 69 is a 2240 cubic inch liquid-cooled V8 with a two-stage, two-speed supercharger. It's very much like the earlier Merlin engine used in P-51 Mustangs, but with a lot more displacement. The Griffin is larger than the Merlin by 590 cubic inches, or about 9.7 liters. However, the Griffin wasn't too much bigger than the Merlin externally. They were actually pretty close in external dimensions, especially considering that Rolls-Royce was able to get that extra 590 cubic inches inside. It was actually possible to re-engine Merlin-powered airplanes, smaller airplanes, with Griffins. It wasn't trivial, but the similar external dimensions made it possible, and it was done. The Griffin 69s were used in the spiteful Mark 14s. They spun five-bladed props. Next up, we have the Griffin 85 used in the spiteful Mark 15s. These spun dual three-bladed props that were contra-rotating. The contra-rotating props had the advantage of eliminating the strong asymmetrical propeller forces that would normally be experienced in a smaller prop-driven airplane with this much power. However, only one spiteful was built in this configuration, and it ended up becoming the prototype for the navalized version, the Supermarine Seafang, which we're going to get to later in this video. Other than the drive mechanism for the contra-rotating props, the Griffin 85 is very much like the Griffin 69, but with slightly different reduction gear ratios for the propeller and different supercharger drive ratios. Last up, we have the Griffin 101. I do not have a picture of a Griffin 101. I think it was a very rare engine. But it's basically just like the Griffin 130 shown here, except that the 130 is another type set up to drive contra-rotating props. The 101, on the other hand, is the single prop version of the Griffin 130. It also has a different prop reduction gear ratio. The big deal about the 101, or the 130 for that matter, is that it uses a dual stage three speed supercharger. That third speed gives this engine power throughout a very large altitude range and with smaller supercharger gaps than a two speed would have. In other words, the three speed gives more performance. It's the Griffin 101 that pulled a spiteful up to 494 miles per hour at 27,500 feet, a record for British piston-powered aircraft. That's 795 kilometers per hour at 8,382 meters for you fans of the metric system. The spiteful carried four 20-millimeter cannons, which was the standard armament of the time. Nearly all the superprop fighters had gone to that configuration. The Spiteful had a decent amount of ammunition, too, with a total of 624 rounds, a little more than the Hawker Sea Fury's 580, but a lot less than the Corsair Dash 5's 924. The Spiteful's cockpit looks to be an improvement on the Spitfires, but a step behind most other super props. At least that's what I think. There are very few pictures of this cockpit, and I don't have the pilot's manual for the Spiteful, so it's a bit hard to say. I can say that there was a lot of focus at the time on making planes easier for the pilots to fly and manage, so it makes sense that the cockpit would be at least somewhat better. During the war, huge numbers of planes were lost in non-combat related accidents. The Supermarine Spitfire certainly suffered its share of losses in takeoff and landing accidents, and quite a bit of that could be attributed to the very narrow landing gear. That was rectified in the Spiteful. The Spiteful has wide tracked inward retracting landing gear, much like an FW-190 or a P-51. The Spiteful also has inner gear doors so that the landing gear is fully enclosed when retracted. That was fairly standard by this point in fighter plane design, 
But just a few years earlier, say in 1943, most fighters did not have fully enclosed landing gear. There isn't a lot of information on this plane, nor are there a lot of pictures of Spitefuls, so I have to apologize for using the same ones multiple times in this video. Production of the Spitefuls was very short-lived. The first flight of a production Spiteful was on April 2nd, 1945. Production of the plane ended the very next month, as did the war in Europe, leaving no chance of the Spiteful ever entering military service. They would be used for testing, research, things like that, but there was never a squadron of armed Spitefuls flying around. In hindsight, this was probably the right choice. The war was over, the British economy smashed, and prop-driven fighters were being eclipsed by the new jet fighters, not the least of which was the Supermarine Attacker, which used the same basic wing design as the Spiteful. This sort of immediate obsolescence was not unique to the Spiteful. It happened to Republic's XP-72. It also happened to Britain's Martin Baker MB-5. Really, any fighter that came out once the jets were showing up, any prop-driven fighter, that is, was going to be dead on arrival, with two notable exceptions. One is long-range fighter escort, which I'll talk about another time. Just know that the new jet fighters didn't have much range. The other exception was for carrier-based naval fighters. It took some time to adapt the new jets for carrier operation, which meant there was a period of a few short years in which the naval super props really did matter. Supermarine did build the Spiteful in such a way that they could create a navalized version of it, and that's just what they did. This was called the Sea Fang. Think of it as a Spiteful with the Griffin 89 driving those contra-rotating props with about 2,350 horsepower. Only 18 were built, so this didn't go anywhere either. It was simply too late and did not offer any real advantage over Supermarine's own Seafire 47 or Hawker's excellent Sea Fury. I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that the Royal Navy was a bit wary of Supermarine shipboard fighters. The Sea Fires of World War II, the navalized version of the Spitfires, did not hold up well to shipboard duty. Neither did the Sea Fire 47. I think they may have been skeptical of yet another naval fighter from Supermarine that was ultimately built from a land-based version. Whatever the case, the Sea Fang was never adopted into service, faded away very quickly. Normally around this point in the video, I try to come up with some way of scoring all of this as I'm trying to kind of decide what was the ultimate super prop. This video is part of a playlist, and there are quite a few in the series. If you've been following along, it's been a bit of a process of elimination, with the Corsair Dash 5 and the Hawker Sea Fury being what are, in my opinion, the best of the super props we've talked about so far. Republic's XP-72, while awesome, simply never went into production. Prototypes often show amazing promise, but when the realities of production show up, sometimes they don't look so amazing anymore. So we don't know how good the XP-72 really would have been had it gone forward. North American's P-51H certainly has everything by the numbers. Speed, range, everything. And it did go into production. However, the U.S. Air Force never sent it into combat. They sent the older, more rugged World War II models to Korea instead. They felt that the lightweight H model was too fragile for the realities of that war. It's a similar story with the U.S. Navy's Bearcat. It never went into combat with the United States either. As the rigors of war often manifest the shortcomings of otherwise apparently great airplanes, I tend to give more weight to planes that were proven in actual warfare. I give some lesser amount to planes that saw service but no combat, like the P-51H. The Spiteful and Sea Fang were full of promise. Had it not been for the jets, I think maybe they would have been able to fulfill that promise. However, the reality is that they didn't, and thus, at least in my opinion, cannot unseat the Sea Fury or the Corsair Dash 5 from the top of the heap at this point. That said, as a minimum, these were very fast airplanes and well-armed. The Griffin 101 powered Spiteful at 494 miles per hour just might have been the fastest super prop and the Sea Fang at 475 miles per hour was the fastest carrier-capable superprop. That's all for now. Goodbye, and have a great day.